In this video, we're going to be taking a look at recurrent neural networks and long short term memory or LSTMs. So recurrent neural networks have a wide array of applications. These include time series analysis, document classification, and speech slash voice recognition. In contrast to feed forward art artificial neural networks, the predictions made by recurrent neural networks depend on the previous state, that is the previous predictions. To elaborate, suppose that we developed a exercise routine where we first lifted weights, then we swam, and then we did yoga, and we alternated that every single day. A recurrent neural network could then predict what exercise we're going to do today given the exercise we did yesterday. So for example, if we went to the gym today, or yesterday I should say, then we're gonna swim today. So more often than not, the problems you're gonna be tackling in the real world are going to be a function of the current state as well as other inputs. So going back to our exercise example, we can add a additional input and that's whether we are playing hockey or not. And let's say that, that in the event we are playing hockey, then we're going to decide to skip the gym. And so now our model has to predict whether we're going to go to the gym or not based off what we did the other day, as well as whether we're playing hockey or not. So long short term memory are a kind is a kind of recurrent neural network. And its purpose is that or the reason for it is that recurrent neural networks have a few um, problems with them. So for instance, if we decided to add a rest day, that should only be taken after two days of exercise, the recurrent neural network can actually end up in a loop. So let's take a look at what that would look like. So let's say we lifted weights, and then we swam. And so the, the following day, on day three, we should be taking a rest day. Now, regular recurrent neural networks only have access to the previous prediction. And so all they know is that we swam yesterday. It doesn't know whether we took a break before we did swimming or whether we did some other kind of exercise. And so it can get into this loop where it's constantly predicting that we should be taking a break and you end up taking more breaks than you should. And so LSTMs combat this by storing uh, more information and thus the name, right? So short-term memory. So you can think of humans, right? Our working memory, we can store roughly seven bits of information at once and LSTMs kind of work the same way. Now this raises the question as to how far back they should go, right? At what point does the information become irrelevant? So for example, going back uh, to our exercise routine, well, we should only be storing information for the last two days because anything beyond that isn't useful in predicting whether we should take a break or not. <laughs> And so without delving into too much details, essentially um, a LSTM layer, a single LSTM layer is composed of four neural networks interacting in a special way. And so we have a neural network that actually does the predicting. We have one that's useful in ignoring certain information. We have one that's useful in forgetting certain information. And then we have another one that's used to select information. And 
in the real world, this is useful in things like natural language processing, where the meaning of a word varies depending on its context. And so let's say that we were doing semantic analysis where we want to classify a uh, documents as having a certain rating based off the occurrences, the occurrence of some words. So let's say that we suppose that all the reviews that have the word good in them should be classified as positive. However, you can end up in, with situations where good is preceded by the word not. And so if the person says not good, then obviously we don't want to classify that review as being positive. And so LSTMs can remember a certain amount of information. So let's say the length of the sentence, and we can use that to classify the documents. And so in the preceding section, we're going to go through my solution to a Kaggle competition. And this Kaggle competition was to classify reviews as being either negative, somewhat negative, neutral, somewhat positive, and positive. So we're going to go ahead and import the following libraries. And if we take a look at a sample of what our training set looks like, we have the phrase and sentence ID, which are useful for um, evaluating our solution or the predictions made by our model. We have the actual phrases. And then we have the corresponding sentiments. And as you can see here, um, some of the phrases repeat. And then if we take a look at our testing set, it's more or less the same thing, only this time we don't have the corresponding sentiments because this is a Kaggle competition and they won't give us that. Um, so ASCII characters are ultimately interpreted by the computer as hexadecimal, so numbers, and in consequence, a capital A is not interpreted the same as a small a. And it's for this reason that we'll want to bring all the characters to lowercase. Um, another thing is that it will interpret a word with a period or a comma after it differently than one without. And so we want to make sure that we separate all the words from the punctuation. And finally, um, contractions will be interpreted differently than the actual words. And so I'm will be interpreted differently than I am. And so we want to convert all those back to um, the original. So we'll go ahead and run this. And then we'll use the apply function on our pandas data frame to apply that to all our phrases. So the next thing we're going to look at is the phrase lengths. And so since we're feeding our documents through a neural network, all the uh, input dimensions have to be the same. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take the maximum phrase length, which is 53, and then we're going to change all the documents so that they have that length. So we're going to go ahead and run this. So this is just various hyperparameters. Um, we're going to create a data frame that contains our target labels, so the sentiments. Um, so computers don't understand words. And so what we want to do is we want to split sentences up into individual words, and then we can actually apply machine learning to that. So to do that, we can use the tokenizer class uh, from Keras. And we can also, so in passing it the number of words, we're essentially saying, um, use x amount of 
the most commonly used words in the document. And then we're also going to use a filter to remove any uh, special characters. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to use the pad sequence to change all the documents so that they're the same length. And it does that by um, just appending zero. So when you use the tokenizer, it will actually change all of the words into integers, but it reserves zero um, for, for things like this for padding. And then we use two categorical to change our to encode our sentiments such that um, they're no longer integers, but they correspond to a one and then the rest are a zero and a vector of length five. So we'll go ahead and run that. So we will create our model. So we're going to use a embedding layer to start. We're going to use dropout and then we have our LSTM layer right here, followed by a regular artificial neural network layer, more dropout, and then we have a artificial neural network with 10 neurons each corresponding, or sorry, five neurons each corresponding to one of the sentiments or classes. So now we'll go ahead and fit our model. And uh, I'm going to come back when this is done. And we're back. And so as you can see, it roughly ended with 70% accuracy. If we take a look at the plots right here, we have the validation loss actually gets worse as we train the model, but the training loss decreases. And uh, the same thing for the accuracy. So. I'm not too sure why that was there because Kaggle doesn't give us the labels for the testing set. And so in conclusion, recurrent neural networks can be used to predict phenomenon that depends on the preceding state. So we covered how it could be used for semantic analysis where it is able to classify documents based off a word and its context. So all the words that led up to it. And so thank you for watching. If you have any questions, let me know in the comments.